Hello my fellow book addicts, Megan here, and time for another book review. Today, I'm going to be talking about The Lost Prince by Julie Kagawa, and this is book one in the Call of the Forgotten series. So for those of you who do not know, The Call of the Forgotten is basically a spin-off of The Iron Fae, and we're following Ethan Chase's point of view instead of Megan or any of the old gang. So we're going to get a bunch of new characters in this book, which is nice, you know, distance ourselves from the old ones a bit, but we still see them. They haven't totally vanished. We're just getting a new batch of characters, you know, mix things up a bit. And when I picked this up, I was extremely interested because we're seeing things from Ethan's point of view. We didn't see much of him in the other books, you know, he was kidnapped by the Fae as a four-year-old child and kept in the Iron Realm. Megan had to come and free him. And he's had a few brushings with the Fae in the next books after that. But other than that, we didn't see too much of him. And obviously with all that going on in his childhood, there's no way he's going to be distanced from the Fae completely throughout the rest of his life. And I was interested to see how having all that happen to him in his childhood affected him as he grew up into a young adult. I believe he is 17 in this series, so it, it's been a while. So like 13-ish years have passed since The Iron Knight. So Ethan is 17 now and in high school. And he's not the cute little guy we met in The Iron King. So he has had the sight his whole life now. So he's able to see the Fae well, even when they are glamoured in the human world, and it's really messed him up. The Fae, the Fae, when they know you have the sight, mess with you beyond all belief. They make your life a living hell. So Ethan has to go through his life day by day pretending he cannot see the Fae. And he takes all these precautions to try and protect himself and his family from the Fae. You know, salt lines around his windows, charms around the house, iron hook iron little trinkets everywhere, and he's paranoid, really. But it's understandable, because he has a legitimate reason to be paranoid. His family no longer are pig farmers. They moved into a more suburban neighborhood because they felt it would be better for Ethan, both safety-wise and social-wise. But for a while now, he's been pushing people away because he doesn't want to grow attached to them, because the people he cares about tend to get hurt, because of the Fae, and because of their association with him. So that's his way of trying to protect himself, as well as everyone else. Because of this, the attitude he has to put on, and his appearance, he is branded as a trouble kid, a troublemaker, a bad boy, and that causes more problems for him as well. So we start the book off, he's starting a new school, and things don't start off well. People have heard rumors about what happened in his last school and his supposed track record. So yeah, he's the subject to a lot of gossip. This one supposedly popular girl approaches him after his first class. She introduces herself as Kenzie and she asks for an interview. It's a thing she does to kind of introduce the new kids who joined in the middle of the year so the rest of the school, you know, gets more of an idea of who they are as a person. And Ethan tries to be a total jerk to her to try and get her to back off before, you know, the Fae take notice. He also gets on the bad side of the star football player who is picking on this poor kid who Ethan can see is part Fae. And he wants to turn away because he's part Fae and even the half-breeds can be dangerous. But he can't. He picks a fight with the jock dude, and he basically gets on their shit list. And the half-breed, whose name is Todd, finds out that Ethan can see him and tries to, you know, become friends with him. Because, you know, he one, Ethan stuck up for him, and two, hey, he won't have to lie or pretend around Ethan. And Ethan, of course, wants nothing to do with him. So Ethan has quite a bit going on. Todd actually arrives at his house asking for help because there is these creepy new fae stalking him. Nothing that Todd recognizes and nothing that sounds familiar to Ethan. And Ethan doesn't want to help, but he makes Todd promise, okay, if I help you, after this, I want you to never approach me, never talk to me again, 
none of your little pigsky friends should approach me. Basically, don't be in my life. Get the hell out of my life, and I will help you. And Todd helps, because he feels like his life is in danger. And unfortunately, at school the next day, Todd goes missing, and the creepy fae approach Ethan. And they are nothing that he has seen before. They are totally alien to him, and they just don't feel right. And this mysterious fae threatens him to not interfere with their business, and he will be left alone. So, the book is basically him trying to figure out what's going on and find Todd and get him out of whatever mess he is in and trying to figure out who the hell these creepy fae are. So not too much I can say without going to spoilers further. So if you have not read this far yet, I suggest you click away now. Go read the book because I highly recommend it. So far I am loving the Call of the Forgotten series. And if you like the Iron Fae, you definitely, definitely should pick this up because it's an awesome continuation. So now, without further ado, spoiler time. So once Todd goes missing, Ethan doesn't think there's much he can do at first. He tries to go on his life as normal, but, you know, these unknown Fae come after him. And Kenzie, who is ironically with him, and there's only one way that Ethan can get them out of this bad situation, because these unknown fae want to kill them, or him and then Kenzie. So he does the one thing that he can think of to save them both. So a while ago, years ago, when he was still a kid, Megan basically cut her mortal family out of her life, she told them that it's probably best if she stay away, she has responsibilities, and she doesn't want to drag them back into, like, fae policies and all this crap. But she does one thing with Ethan. She gives him this token and tells him to only use it in severe emergencies, and it will bring him into the never-never and to her. So this kind of qualifies as an emergency, so he uses the token and it teleports him and Kenzie to the Never Never. So poor Kenzie is just kind of thrust into this craziness. And Ethan has to explain it all to her. And she actually takes things very, very calmly. This token brought them to Grimalkin, who will be escorting them to the Iron Court to see Megan. And Megan, while well, she's pretty happy to see her little brother again, but... But once she hears about these unknown fae, she wants Ethan to stay in the Iron Court where she can keep an eye on him because he's in danger, obviously. She offers to bring Kenzie home, but Kenzie would rather stay here and see things out through the end. And we do find out more about her life, and I do feel bad for her. Her dad seems like a total jerk. And, you know, Ethan doesn't want to stay here. He wants to find Todd because he doubts that's going to be high on Megan's priority list. But he's not stupid enough to think that he can get them out on his own. That's when this new guy named Kieran shows up into the picture. And he offers to help Kenzie and Ethan get the hell out of there. And he takes them to Lena Sith. And she reveals that Kieran is Megan and Ash's son. Which makes him Ethan's nephew. And Kieran knew who Ethan was and really wanted to meet him because apparently Megan never told Kieran about his human family. And obviously Megan didn't tell her human family about Kieran. There is a reason for this, which is explained in one of the Iron Fang novellas. So Ethan's like beyond shocked. And he's kind of pissed at Megan for keeping this information from his family. It's like, you kept this big secret from us, what were you thinking? And apparently Karen is pretty sweet on this s summer exile whose name I cannot remember off the top of my head right now. But yeah, she was exiled because supposedly Queen Titania heard a rumor that someone thought she was like more beautiful or talented or something. So in a rage, Titania exiled her. Karen brought her to Lena Sith. Because it's safer for their, her there. She won't fade away as quickly because she's not surrounded by so much iron. Apparently a lot of exiles are going to Lena Sith right now. 
Apparently these unknown Fae who call themselves the Forgotten are kidnapping exiles and half-breeds and they kill the exiles. We don't know what they do with the half-breeds. They basically drain the glamour from the exiles and that's kind of what's keeping them going right now, keeping them alive. Apparently the Forgotten are Fae that no one remembers, either mortal or Fae. So, because they aren't remembered, they start fading into nothingness un until they are gone. We meet a whole lot of Forgotten, a whole town of Forgotten, in the Iron Knight. So, there's, there's a tie between that somewhere. So, Kieran, Kenzie, and Ethan are working together to try and figure out what the heck is going on. So, I, I like the little parallels between Ethan and Kieran and Ash and Puck. Because, frankly, I loved Ash and Puck's dynamic. I like, you know, the balance of Goofy Goofball and Mr. Bruden, serious dude. So I like seeing that again, but in two different characters and portrayed a bit differently. Karen's not quite as outrageous as Puck, and Ethan's not quite as intense as Ash, which I like. It's not a carbon copy, but the, sim the similarities are enough to make me a very, very happy reader. The Forgotten have this queen who is trying to, you know, protect the other Forgotten to not let them fade completely into nothingness. She feels bad that they have to kill traditional Fae to stay alive, but sacrifices gotta be made. Apparently they drain the glamour and magic from Half-Bloods too, which makes them mortal, which is, you know, cool, you know. They can live a normal human life now instead of being stuck between this awkward, not fairy, but not human in between. But draining their glamour comes at a huge cost. It doesn't make them themselves anymore. Because they're having like half of their being stripped away. So they don't remember who they are. They just don't remember anything. It happened to poor Todd and he doesn't remember anything. And it made me really hate the fun seeing this. Killing Faye? Yeah, that's horrible. And it sucks. And it, it makes them really evil in my eyes. But seeing what they did to the half-breeds, that just... There's no redeeming qualities for the fun now. They... I think they should all die now because of that. And at the end, I am really, really iffy about Kieran. Like, how he hesitated to save Ethan from the Forgotten Soldiers and actually makes a deal with the Forgotten Queen to see her again as, like, a guest. So that gives me a really bad feeling. And that sucks, because I don't want to have a bad feeling about Kieran. I want to like Kieran a lot. In fact, I started liking him a lot in this book, but once that happened, it made me really hesitate to like him now. So in this book, we also see Puck for a little bit here, which makes me happy. A little cameo appearance by Puck. So... Ethan and Kenzie become kind of a couple in this book, and she reveals that she does have leukemia. So she feels guilty, you know, getting in a relationship with Ethan because she doesn't really have a long life ahead of her. So we end the book, the fun kind of disappear, and Ethan and Kenzie are free to go home. Ash is not happy with Kieran. And, you know, Kenzie and Ethan are free to go home now. Several days have passed since... You know, they went into the Never Never, so they got some explaining to do. So, with that said, I'm going to stop myself here. And yeah, that is it for this book review, and I hope to see you guys next time. Keep on reading, my fellow book addicts. Keep on reading.